Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Chicago, KubeCon, Cloud Native Conference, CNCF, CUBE's coverage, every single KubeCon that the CNCF has put on, the Cube has been there, except for the early days, we had a couple of guests here that have been to every single KubeCon. We got David Aronchek with Expanso, formerly with Microsoft, Google, Cube alumni, I've been around the block many times, and Omri Gazit, co-founder of Certo, industry veterans, Dustin Kirkland, my co-host, guest analyst, also the VP of engineering, Chain Guard. This segment really is about people who have been in the industry multiple cycles and to look at what's going on now in this world of KubeCon as Kubernetes starts to go mainstream and operational technology, what's that enablement? We've got great guests. Guys, thanks for coming on. Appreciate you coming Thank on you the so Thank you for having us. All right, so you've been around the, the industry a few cycles, guys. Web services, um, the day, now cloud, now AI's here. What do you guys see here at KubeCon that's the most interesting um, story relative to this next level of enablement? Yeah, it's uh, interesting how, you know, kind of everybody's trying to look at AI and try to find the angle here. Um, you know, it seems like AI is now dominated by people who can afford buying NVIDIA gear, uh, and that's not a lot of us. <laughs> Um, but for us, we actually continue to be really excited about kind of building the next layer on top of, you know, kind of the core infrastructure. So identity and access, you know, are, are kind of next in mind, and specifically the access piece feels really exciting. I've seen more awareness now of the fact that uh, you can externalize authorization than any time I've ever seen in the past. Hey, what's your take on KubeCon this year? You've seen Absolutely. from the beginning, as it starts to flower out and grow, what you know, I think there's, there's kind of an immutable truth that always happens, right? You get these pendulum swings that go back and forth. It goes way, way, way over to the infrastructure side, then it comes way, way, way back to the, the application side. You go to the control slide on one side, you go to the data side on the other. I think we are seeing a pretty big swing back. Exactly like you just said, you know, H100s and so on, NVIDIA is really, really expensive. People are starting to have to be thinking about their application layer and their data layer and being much more thoughtful about it. Uh, Kubernetes will be an incredible innovator around that. There's no question to, to help things pack together and so on, but people, uh, organizations that want to succeed, that take advantage of all these models, will have to think about how to schedule against data, how to think about data, move data, uh, and at that, at that application layer. What's interesting, Dustin, is that we, you know, we actually, we, I think your first interview in the cube was OpenStack in like 2015. <laughs> um, now you've got multiple hyperscalers in market. You have a lot more scale at that level. And then you got now this app dev community coming in, developer productivity is the buzzword, yeah. but like a whole nother generation coming in. The scale and the data tsunami coming in is just an unprecedented. It's a whole different game now, like because you have now new power dynamics in yeah. the industry. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I, I want to compliment Dave here and say that uh, I've known Dave a long time and he was the first person who really clued me into how big machine learning could be uh, one day. And I, I think we're there and you know, I, I certainly yeah. woke up uh, to a whole, a whole different world uh, with that. Um, I'm really curious about your take on something Omri just said, uh, and, and Dave came to as well with you know, the, the expense around H100s. Do you think there's a world that emerges where there are haves and have nots uh, when it comes to AI, ML, inferencing, you know, smarter decision making? Omri? Well, honestly, I think that you know, the big uh, players here are you know, driving down costs so much and democratizing the technology. You know, I don't think that there are going to be a lot of infrastructure players outside of. You think it you know, will the be democratized? Then I, I do think that you know, like the la the level of scale that they have is unmatchable by small companies. Uh, you know, so if you are a startup that's trying to innovate at the AI infrastructure level, you're going to have to find your niche. Uh, but there's so many applications. You know, LLMs, of course, all the rage. You know, I'm excited about just like plain old machine learning, you know, <laughs> where you, know, you take a bunch of you know, access logs, for example, and you run like anomaly detection on them and figure out, oh, this user you know, signed a purchase order, but they're in a, the engineering group. 
how does that work, right? Like, yeah. that is a class, classic application of machine learning. It doesn't need, you know, H100s. You don't have to yeah. buy one of those. You know, all you need yeah. is actually to have some capability that's available from a cloud provider. That's all you need. You know, what's interesting about that is that, you know, there's an old expression in, in, uh, in the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial world is, that's a feature, not a company. Remember the, yes. that saying? Exactly. Now, exactly. you can actually make a company out of a feature mm -hmm. because the solo entrepreneur models coming back where you can pick a vertical and go deep mm -hmm. on something mm -hmm. and be very successful. I, absolutely. Um, you know, to, to uh, Dustin's point earlier, like I think there, I, I think you're exactly right. Um, there's basically two players in the world, not the haves and the have-nots. Those that sell, I, I like to joke, specialized electricity, and those that don't. Specialized electricity looks like storage, compute, and networking. Everyone else is a layer outside, and and exactly like you said, I think there's going to be yeah. half a dozen at most who do the former. There's plenty of room in business in the second. And, and to your point about the speed of innovation, the thing that ML, like these larger models do, is they really transform the way you store knowledge and access it. So now, you can say, hey, you know what, here's a ridiculous amount of structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. I want you to compress it into a, a place where you can store it in, I don't know, even if it's large, 10 gigabytes of memory. Uh, or, or disk, and then I'm going to give you arbitrary questions against that. Was that available before? Sure, but you had to like build this very deep structured thing like that. Now you can say, to your prototype example, hey, you know what, I'd like to build a website, I'd like to have three buttons on it, I'd like to have this. You have a way that you can interact with that body of knowledge in a really straightforward way, human way, and get an output. That output's not going to be a, not going to be a company, yeah. but it's going to be a prototype for a thing really quickly. I want to, before we get to some, what you guys are working on in your companies, because I think it's compelling, you guys have two amazing opportunities. I want to get you guys' thoughts on, 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 on and reaction to this idea of platforms. Mm -hmm. um, I remember about 10 years ago, platform wars were a kind of big conversation. Then the tool market came out, everyone had tools, whether it's cybersecurity. You're seeing now this idea of platforms merging, whether it's cybersecurity. Are there too many platforms? Can, you, can companies um, over rotate on platforms? Or what is a platform in this model if you have all this hyperscale layers? Because you're starting to see, I mean I remember meet, uh, I'm going to see Adam Selesky in a week uh, for a preview for reInvent. Last year I met him, I'm like, um, he's like talking about ISV, so I'm like, well they're an ISV. Well that's an old term. Snowflake is a, it has an ecosystem on top of AWS. Yeah. So does Databricks. Yeah. And they're on Azure. And so you're starting to see companies have platforms without it buying any hardware, to your point about. Is that just super specialized electricity? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, well, what is the platform conversation? Because a lot's going on in this complexity of this world. Um, it's a digital distributed system. An enterprise has to run. So I guess my take on it is obviously the cloud providers all have a whole bunch of services that make available to you. And of course there are other you know, kind of infrastructure vendors like the Snowflakes of the world and that produce really, really useful stuff. But I'm now seeing a whole bunch of enterprises basically saying, you know what, we now have a platform services team and it's not just about running Kubernetes. It's actually about assembling a set of capabilities that we think are going to be you know, kind of like the capabilities that all of our application developers need. Yeah. And in the same way that back in the, I'm old, you know, like back <laughs> in the 90s, like these enterprises said, we only support Oracle and DB2. That's all the databases that we support. Um, I was at Microsoft at the time, it was a little hard to get SQL Server in there, yeah. but yeah, yeah. You know, eventually we did. <laughs> but you know, the point was that these IT departments basically had a set of standards. Yeah. And I think that's the same is happening now with enterprises where they say, we have a standard platform, we use things, uh, you know, they use Terraform, they use Crossplane, they use Pulumi, they use a lot of different things to try to assemble you know, all these different services. And they're trying to create these paths, these like rails, for their application developer team so that they don't have to you know, cobble together their own stuff or reinvent the wheel. Are they building their own or are they using um, vendors to help them? That's the question. 
I think they, they're doing some in some, right? Yeah. So like wherever possible, they're trying to use mature open source and vendor supported technology. And in some places they have to still build their own. But yeah. it's almost like, you know, you, you remember like the platform days, Cloud Foundry, yeah. was this idea of, you know, you had a, a layer and you had all these services underneath and you had a common way yeah. and an easy way for developers to actually get code out. And we're now, I think, seeing that you know, each of these enterprises are trying to create their own specialized platform using all this technology that's now available. To, to reference an, uh, another old school Microsoftism, basically, if, you, if someone else makes money off of your, what you're selling and making money off of, then you have a platform. And, and in Microsoft days, it was like, uh, Steve Ballmer would stand up and say like, if we are so happy that for every $10 spent on the Windows ecosystem, someone else makes nine. We make a dollar. And that's a really, yeah. really important thing. Um, and, and you mentioned a key word in there, capabilities, right? You can have any API in the world you want, you can have anything like that, but ultimately it does come down to um, uh, what does the end user need? And a platform for platform's sake, Kubernetes for Kubernetes sake, is not enough. Like people need to do things. They want to host websites or databases, APIs, whatever. They want to like do billing systems. You know all these various things. That's the capability that you're solving. And and most platforms are not enough. People need to build solutions on top in order for them to be a complete uh, picture. One one final point I want to get your reaction to is the AI wave. Obviously, is a generational shift. We see it. Everyone loves it. The younger generation coming in, I've met a couple people here just out of college, like they're, they're quitting their, their jobs and whatever they were in coming into tech, so they have a migration of younger talent coming in. They don't have the scar tissue or the, the what was the web again? Um, so, as veterans, you look at the AI, what gets you most excited about what's going to happen with, with AI? What does that enable? Knowing what we've seen through the, the old, old school, as you look at the future, what do you guys see as the most exciting opportunity? If you were 25 again, what would you be doing? Like, because that's what I always say, like, I wish I was 25 again, another 20 years of <laughs> just grabbing this wave and taking it, what do you guys see? Well, for me, um, you know, I think that when I was, you know, back in school studying computer science, I always look, you know, through <laughs> that lens of an engineer because yeah. I'll always be an engineer at yeah. heart. Um, you know, I was excited about you know going from assembler to high-level languages. You know, building compilers. Those are the tools that I think about. And today, the tools are just so vastly different, right? Like you can just like David said, you can envision an application, describe it to a computer, and the computer will generate a pretty good first draft of what you actually want. It's it's mind blowing, right? For people who've like you know kind of tried to build this stuff, you know, kind of like brick by brick. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, like the level of capability that you now have as a developer is staggering. And so you know, like just like back in the day, I learned computer science stuff, and some of it was useful, of course. But when I actually went to build you know my first startup, you know, a lot of what was really useful was you know kind of like much higher level than that. You know, I think that you know today. University grads really uh, would be served well to go look at all the amazing stuff available to them. You know, Copilot is a small example of that, but you yeah. know, every student should actually go use the you know the, like the latest and greatest tools because that will make them so much more productive than they can be without them. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it, you you touched on the key word there. It's productivity and. The idea that you're going to be able to, at any point in the near future, I, I'm genuine, and like, I have been absolutely floored with the progress that has happened so far, but if, even if in 10 years, a entire solution, a, an essay, a journal article, a, an app, you name it, is created without the interaction of a human, seems highly unlikely. Like you're always going to, no matter how good it is, you're always going to want that last human bridge to take it to market in order to make it real. Now that said, from a productivity side, it's enormous, right? I say like, I, I was telling someone last night, about 100% of what I write, and I write a lot, PRDs, blog posts, and stuff, about 100% of what I write, I started at, uh, you know, in an outline in, in some GPT, right? Some model. Uh, about a, like 100% of my unit testing, right? Has been, you know, pre-written by, by Copilot. 
you know, that's great, but it's just a start. Yeah. At the end of it, you know, code is pretty good, right? It, like, probably 80% of it still remains. With the essays, eh, I don't know, 10, 15% remains, but it gets me past the writer's block. Like, and now I'm like, oh, that, that sentence doesn't make any sense at all. They're talking about whatever, <laughs> welding, I, I, what the hell? It's the scaffolding, you stand up exactly. some basic exactly. stuff. So I personally think it goes back to that thing that I was saying earlier. You now have an opportunity to interact with these things in new and interesting ways. They're able to pull information in that, that is really valuable for you that you may not even know is out there or a, a particular structure that you weren't thinking about. And then you can kind of go from there. So it gets you past the cold start problem. Sorry. Awesome. Yeah, so I'd get, can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit from each of you. You're both startup founders, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the middle of this space. How are you helping your customers with you know, some of these problems? Yeah, so for us, you know, we get really excited about um, the access part of identity and access like I talked about. And uh, this is a classic example of something that everybody rolls their own. You know, just like 10 years ago, people rolled their own login. Just like, you know, my previous startup, um, we tried to do speech to text. And I literally kind of stood up a service based on Microsoft's speech API, you know, running on some kind of Windows server thing, and I created an API in front of it because there was no web service to do it. Um, you know, today we have all this stuff. We have, you know, Google Translate, we have, you know, Twilio, we have, you know, Stripe. There's all these things that we don't have to build anymore. And so the thing that I'm really excited about for developers is helping them get out of the business of building access control, you know, which is 20% of the logic of every application. It's boilerplate logic. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. manual, it's error prone, it's mind numbing, it's soul crushing. Yeah. And, so, and yet if you get it wrong, if you, you have get it wrong, serious problems. It's, yeah, and it's it turns problem. out that 94% of the applications that OWASP tests have some form of broken access yeah. control. Right. You know, <laughs> that, we're so a victim of that, I'm telling that's, you. Sorry. That's <laughs> the nightmare. piece that we get excited about is like taking something that is just yeah. so dumb to continue to go reinvent and actually making it available as a standard developer yeah. API. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we're really on the uh, kind of other end of the spectrum. We're on the platform side. Um, our platform is an the open source product, Baca Yao. Uh, uh, it means COD in Portuguese because we're all about compute over data. So how do you take these jobs? Kubernetes is amazing, but it is very centralized. It, it normally works best in a single zone. When you think about 57% of all data being created outside of core data centers and with network growth nowhere near keeping up as much, how do you take these containers, WASM, binaries, and move them to the place where the data is being created? And so- Like the edge. Could the be edge. the edge, could be, like a lot of people are like, don't even realize, when the second you get outside of a single zone or a single region, even if you're entirely on a single cloud, you're likely going to have to start having problems. So if I have images in South Korea and Brazil and Belgium, maybe I have regulations, GDPR, that doesn't allow them to move. Maybe I just want to leave them there because I don't want to pay the ingress, egress, cross zone fees. How do you take a model, for example, deploy it to all of those places, build intelligence around it, and then get only the results back? That's what our platform is designed to build for. That's a hard problem. It is a hard problem, and you know, I joke. Uh, uh, I happen to know uh, the the uh, from my Google days, um, uh, Eric Brewer, the inventor of Cap Theorem, and I was pitching him on the, on this idea. I'm like, I, I'm be, am I being crazy about this? He's like, No, you're not being crazy. You're, you're taking the the instead of doing the C and the A portion of Cap Theorem, which is consistency and availability, you're focusing on A and P, support for network partitioning. Yeah. It is 40 years of distributed systems knowledge. We're just trying to like, yeah, yeah. you know, break through a little bit. <laughs> and all bit kinds there. of real time. Absolutely. So how far along are you? How, when did this company start? Uh, where are you guys in the progress? Are you raising money? What's the status? We, we, um, uh, we started a year and a half ago in February. That was the first line of code written. Uh, we just hit 1.0 in May and 1.1 uh, in August. Uh, we will have some very big announcements uh, next week, um, which we're really <laughs> excited to Looking like about. you got a little fat check coming can't say yet. I, I wouldn't. I, I <laughs> you wouldn't got a big be, smile. I'm You're not, not, I'm not saying no. I'm not saying no. Um, but uh, you know, we're growing like mad, and, and yeah. we're uh, we're going to talk about some customers we have next week as well. So we, you know, we we've been really, really lucky coming to a conference like this. That's that's the one thing that you know I, I've been like you to to most of the cube cons and yeah. just the 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 ecosystem, the yeah. inclusion, the the way that it brings everyone together. It's just so wonderful. And and you know, I, I leave here with. 
10 times as many ideas as I had coming yeah. in because there's just so much And you much got great relationships, you got, got good work there. Congratulations on your venture. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to tracking that news. Talk about Acerta, where are you guys at now? What's the status there? Uh, what's, what's, your, what's your update? Yeah, this month it's, uh, is our third birthday and the first birthday of Topaz, our open source uh, project. Uh, we just shipped, we yeah. announced uh, on Monday, we launched our version 0.30. So we're not quite at 1.0, you know, like we basically take the, like, the yeah. Terraform approach, <laughs> you know, kind of like <laughs> takes a little bit of time to get yeah. to, to 1.0, but super excited yeah. about this particular release. It basically brings together, you know, the best ideas that we know about in yeah. authorization. One of them is open policy agent, policy as code. The other one we actually got from Google uh, with the Zanzibar project over there. They wrote uh, the Zanzibar paper now about three years ago. We read it just when we started the company, and we decided that we're going to be the first platform that brings policy as code and policy as data yeah. together in a single open source project. I really love what you guys are doing, and every time I, I chat with you, I think of how inadequate our law <laughs> our sign on in Silicon Angle is. We've got four different sites, tokens, and what. <laughs> We're going to fix hard, that, right? we're going <laughs> to fix that, believe me. Yeah, being self-funded is always the, the last thing you're going to get to. Um, guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Congratulations on your new venture and your success, continued success, and uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thanks so much, Josh. Thank thanks so, so much. much. All right, we're back with more live coverage after this short break. Stay with us. <laughs>